Yeah, so there's a lot of software out there for um, doing some more of these advanced modeling algorithms um, and, and trying to get as much information out of your SACS data as you can. So I won't be going through all of these, um, but many of these you'll be going through over the next uh, day or two. Um, so probably one of the most straightforward is just structure fitting, where you have an X-ray crystal structure or an NMR structure or a prime EM structure, and then you have a scattering profile from the structure and solution, and you just want to know, does it fit, right? Does it look the same in solution as it does in the crystal, which is often um, not the case. And so one of the first things we'll go over is how that process is actually done um, and how you can actually calculate a scattering profile from your crystal structure or your, or your atomic model and see whether or not it fits your experimental data. And then the next thing we'll go over is ab initio 3D reconstruction, where you can actually take your one-dimensional scattering profile and have it generate, have the algorithm generate a 3D model that actually matches that scattering profile. So it's kind of amazing that you can, you can do that, right? The idea that you can generate a 3D model from a 1D scattering profile seems a bit counterintuitive. But there are a host of other methods um, that uh, include things like rigid body modeling. Um, you can do some more advanced docking with energy calculations. Flexible fitting is very common where you can actually look at conformational changes. Ensemble modeling is one of the very popular things that you can do with uh, SACS to look at um, flexible systems. Um, there's a host of different things that, uh, that'll be covered over, uh, over the next day or so. So like I said, we're gonna focus on the first two um, uh, to start with here. Okay, so when it comes to modeling three-dimensional structural data and, and, and really generating 3D models from the solution scattering data, there have been a variety of approaches that have been developed over the last 40, 50, 60 years, actually, for, for quite some time now. Um, but largely, the first way of doing this was just generating simple shapes. You just have some kind of ellipsoid or a cylinder or um, a core shell or something like that. And you know basically what the what the overall uh, shape of the particle is. Somebody have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so you know what the overall uh, shape of the particle is at, at, at very low resolution, and you want to know effectively what is the size. What are the size parameters? So you adjust the axial ratios of the ellipsoid, for example, or the length and and um, radius of the cylinder. And you fill this envelope defined by the shape with a single homogeneous density, effectively. And you calculate a scattering profile from it, and you adjust the parameters until it best matches your data. You can do this with collections of simple shapes. Um, and then uh, spherical harmonics came along that uh, were, where they were applied to defining these shapes. So rather than just having simple shapes, you could actually have much more complex um, uh, shapes, but there were a lot of issues with this. Um, and so uh, that was sort of supplanted by bead modeling. And coarse grain bead modeling has really become one of the primary ways of doing ab initio uh, modeling of the um, uh, 1D scattering profiles. And so in, in bead modeling or any kind of coarse grain modeling, what you're really doing is having some kind of grid. And this grid is filled with a bunch of small volumes where all the volumes are identical. In this case, they're spheres, they're small beads that have a radius of, I don't know, five angstroms, something like that. Um, and you have a few thousand of them and you just kind of turn them on and off and see which configuration of beads best matches your scattering profile. Um, and then there's hybrid modeling. And hybrid modeling is kind of a really broad umbrella term for a lot of the different types of modeling that you can do. So, so you can include pretty much anything that's not just scattering information, but also structural information from some kind of atomic model. For example, you can do um, the structure fitting that we just talked about that we're going to talk about in a moment with, with crystal structures. You can do rigid body modeling, flexible fitting, all those different types of modeling you can do um, uh, that fall under the heading of hybrid modeling. Um, all of these different uh, scenarios fall under the heading of modeling, where you actually generate thousands of different models, typically, and you calculate scattering profiles from them, and you see which model best fits your data in order to select which three-dimensional uh, model is, is appropriate. And then there's a new... Um, uh, algorithm that I've developed um, that I'll talk about sort of in the second half of this talk, 
which is actually performing the inverse problem. It's actually calculating an electron density function directly from the scattering profile. And in that sense, it's somewhat unique among uh, modeling algorithms. It's an ab initio approach, um, and we'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. But to start with, we'll talk about structure modeling, where you actually have an atomic model, OK? So all of the different modeling approaches require you to be able to calculate an accurate scattering profile from an atomic model in order to be able to compare it. So it's very important that these calculations are not only accurate, but they also have to be pretty fast computationally, because a lot of times you're going to be calculating thousands or maybe even millions of different scattering profiles from many different candidate models in order to select which model is uh, the most optimal. So there's a lot of different algorithms that exist for this purpose, um, but they generally all fall under the category of primarily two different ways of calculating scattering profiles. Probably the most common one is the Debye equation um, and also the uh, spherical harmonics approximation. So we'll real briefly go over this Debye equation. So it's shown on the bottom here. So we have the intensity as a function of Q, our scattering profile, is equal to a double sum over atoms I and J. So if you have N atoms in your atomic model, you take each atom I and you calculate this equation between atom I and atom J, right? So atom one to atom two, you look at the form factor Fi of atom one and then the form factor of atom two. So the form factors are different for different atom types, like a carbon will have a different form factor. Okay, so you have the form factor of carbon atom one and the form factor of oxygen atom two, you multiply them together. And then you have this sine of X over X term where um, the argument here is dependent on the distance between the atoms. So whatever the distance is, Rij between atom one and atom two in this case. And then you do this for every pair of atoms, atom one to atom two, one to three, one to four, and you go through N atoms and then two to one, two to three, two to four. And then you go through all these pairs. So there's N squared calculations. So this is a pretty expensive calculation, right? It takes a while to actually calculate this. So people have come up with a lot of different ways of speeding this up. And there's always these trade-offs of accuracy and speed. One of the big things that has, uh, has to be taken into account when calculating these scattering profiles is the solvent, OK? The solvent is a very non-trivial con uh, contribution to the scattering profile. So there are primarily two different um, parts of the scattering profile um, that are contributed by the solvent. And we'll talk about that in uh, the next slide. So there's a lot of uh, hurdles to this that have to be overcome. One is the fact that solvent is not simple to model. It's not just a trivial thing. You can just say all particles have the same solvent scattering. Every particle will actually have a different solvent scattering uh, contribution. And so it varies from protein to protein, right? Or from, from molecule to molecule. And the reason for that is because the solvent term is actually dependent on the shape of the particle that you are measuring. So not only does the scattering from the particle change when you change particles, but the scattering from the solvent contribution changes. So you have to account for that. Additionally, things like chemical conditions, like the concentration of salts or things like that, can change um, scattering terms such as the contrast, how much electron density relative to the solvent there is, right? Because SACS is a contrast method. There are a lot of algorithms that, I, that I've mentioned um, uh, that uh, use various methods to speed up uh, this expensive calculation. Uh, coarse grain methods are very common where, for example, rather than calculating the scattering from every pair of atoms, you might calculate the scattering from every pair of residues in a protein. And that will dramatically speed up um, the calculation. But of course, it's not quite as accurate because now you're, now you're only taking um, the residue form factor into account as opposed to all of the individual atomic positions. And so there's a bit of an accuracy cost, but it dramatically speeds up the calculation. Nowadays, the most common algorithms for doing this are probably Chrysol and FOXS. Chrysol is part of the ATSAS suite, um, and FOXS is um, uh, a very commonly used. There's a web server for it, and it's used in a bunch of algorithms um, uh, out of Andre Sali's lab. So um, uh, many of these algorithms exist that all give trade-offs for either accuracy or speed 
um, and various levels of complexity, things like molecular dynamics and things like that, explicit solvents, and they all give these trade-offs. All right, so let's talk a little bit more detail about these solvent terms in particular that I just mentioned, because they actually are, are quite important to understand when you're going to run something like price solve, and it's asking you these questions, you know, what do these things actually mean? When it says hydration shell, what does that mean? When it says contrast, uh, what does that mean? So there are primarily two solvent considerations in programs like Chrysol and Fox S and many of the 3D modeling algorithms. And those are excluded volume and hydration shell, okay? So the excluded volume is effectively the scattering contribution from displaced solvent, okay? We'll talk about more, more about what that means in, in just a second, but effectively you have your solvent uh, that your protein is embedded in, right? Either it's water or some kind of buffer um, that, that it's mixed in with. And so it's not in a vacuum. And because it's not in a vacuum, there, you have to account for the fact that when you um, are calculating your scattering profile, that in an experiment, the protein is actually displaced some of the solvent, right? We do these two experiments. We do the protein in the solvent, and then we do the solvent by itself, right? And so you're taking the difference. So therefore, the difference isn't from the protein in a vacuum. It's actually from the protein in the solvent. And so you have to account for the fact that the protein has now displaced some of the solvent, so we call that excluded volume. The other contribution is something called a hydration shell. So hydration shell is a result of the fact that uh, the water molecules in an aqueous solution, typically around things like proteins or other biological macromolecules, will associate with the surface of a particle a little bit more strongly than they associate in the bulk solvent, right? So in the bulk solvent, there's your hydrogen bonding network of, of uh, water molecules just sort of disordered interacting with each other. But when they get near a protein, they're helping to form more hydrogen bonds, right? That's what, one of the reasons why proteins fold, for example. And that causes the water molecules to associate with the surface of the molecule a little bit more tightly. So they tend to be a little bit more ordered. They tend to be there a little bit more frequently than in the bulk solvent where they're more disordered. And so they end up having a slightly larger contrast. This is a pretty small contribution, but it's an important one to take into account. So um, what we have here on the bottom is sort of the modified intensity calculation from the Debye equation, right? So we have the Debye equation, which the way I just showed it kind of assumes it's in vacuum, but you can modify the individual form factors in order to take into account these different scattering components. So we have the form factors um, or really the structure factors here of the particle in vacuum, right, in this term on the left. This is a three-dimensional Q value here, by the way. So this is the full three-dimensional Fourier transform of the atomic density in vacuum. And then we're subtracting from that the contribution of the scattering from the excluded volume, right? So we have to subtract this component. And then we have to add to that the contribution from this hydration shell. And so you can kind of see, this is, this is the output of Chrysol up on the upper right here, where you have the in vacuum scattering, which is the highest one, the largest um, value of the scattering in blue at the top. And then we have our excluded volume, which is actually looks pretty similar to the um, total scattering of the particle, but it's less. And that's because the volume of the solvent is that's being excluded is actually disordered, right? These water molecules are are moving around. And because they're disordered, they don't scatter as strongly or as coherently. And then we have our um, uh, hydration shell way down here. Notice this is on a log scale. So way down here, the hydration shell is a much smaller contribution. And so we're taking effectively the blue curve minus the orange curve plus the green curve. And that's giving you your final red curve, which is your total scattering um, uh, in, in solution, right? And so this is done in three dimensions in this equation. And then you take the um, total amplitude of that and you square it. And then this, these angular brackets with the omega is referring to the fact that we do spherical averaging. And that takes us from a three-dimensional function to a one-dimensional function. And so what happens when you're doing these calculations and you're running a program like Chrysol or Fox S is you're actually fitting these terms, right? You're fitting the excluded volume, how much excluded volume there is, what the contrast is, or what the size of the volume region that you're actually excluding and the overall contrast of the hydration shell, you're fitting these two parameters as free parameters. And so if you run this with different solvents, then it allows, even though it's the same protein structure, for example, but you have different solvents, it allows you to fit um, for those various contrast contributions.
All right, so as I mentioned, um, uh, Sachs measures the particle contrast. So what is contrast? What is this idea of contrast and of, of this idea of the excluded volume term? So in Sachs, what you're actually measuring is the excess electron density relative to the bulk solvent, okay? And so we have to model this fact that we're embedded in a solvent. So as I mentioned before, the excluded volume term accounts for the scattering of the volume of the bulk solvent that has been displaced by the particle in our experiment. And usually what happens in most algorithms is we, we can't really accurately model explicitly what this disordered bulk solvent looks like. It's kind of hard to do from an atomic model. The way that we actually do it in programs like Chrysol or FOXS is that these are modeled as a dummy atom at the locations of the atoms in your protein. For example, if you took your protein and you had all the atom atomic locations, you calculate the scattering from each one of those atoms in vacuum. And then what you do separately is you calculate the scattering of some kind of Gaussian atom um, at each one of those atom locations. And that Gaussian is the sort of the spread of that Gaussian and the size of that Gaussian is the fitted parameter. How much that Gaussian is actually uh, contributing in terms of this excluded volume uh, is what you're fitting. And then you take, for example, your carbon uh, density form factor here in black. You have your fitted dummy atom for the excluded volume, the, the water molecule effectively in uh, the dash line. And then the difference is what you would actually see, this excess scattering contribution. So that's what you're actually fitting when you do this in things like Chrysol or Fox S. And then we have the hydration shell. Um, the hydration shell is done in different ways in different programs. And some programs that are more, um, uh, that, that are like Chrysol, that's just uh, sort of assumed to be an implicit layer around sort of like a shell around the particle envelope. And so in Chrysol, it's like a three angstrom shell. In Fox S, they do something similar, but they actually account for where the solvent molecules are. And they look at like the uh, uh, surface area uh, of the uh, border layer there. Um, there's also explicit solvent uh, calculators uh, that are out there that have, uh, they take much longer to actually run, but they're much more accurate. And so there's a variety of different programs um, that do that. Again, this con the contrast of this layer is a free parameter. So it's, uh, it allows for um, embedding it in different solvents. All right, so like I said, there's a lot of different programs. Chrysol and FOXS are probably the two most um, common, but there are a host of different programs that all give trade-offs for accuracy and speed and um, what information you have available. Um, and here's just a quick comparison. This is Xylose isomerase. You can see that for the most part, they all do a pretty good job. Um, and uh, Chrysol and, and FOXS are, I believe they're two of the fastest, which is one of the reasons they're the most popular. Okay, so that was sort of the structure fitting. Before we go on, does anybody have any questions specifically about the structure fitting aspect of what I see in the chat for the Gaussian for the carbon? Is the Gaussian supposed to account for the solvation influence? Um, Yes, that's the point of it. So the idea is that the Gaussian sort of dummy atom is like a blurred out version of an atom, right? Because we don't know how to model a disordered atom because it's really an ensemble. And so it's, it's difficult to do that. Uh, so we use this Gaussian, which is kind of like a low resolution atom almost. And it sort of blurs together all these different um, atom contributions from the water. Because what would happen is if you just put a water molecule in there, it would have far more scattering than the protein, right? Because most of the protein is carbon, whereas water is oxygen, right? Oxygen and two hydrogens. And so the oxygen would have a far greater scattering contribution. And the reason why we don't do that is because the water is not rigid, right? It's, it's moving around, it's disordered. And so we're kind of uh, simulating that effect by having this Gaussian atom rather than just a single water atom. I, I hope that, that answers your question. It includes the motion of the carbon. Um, you're not modeling it as a carbon. You're modeling it as a Gaussian. Um, and a carbon doesn't look like a Gaussian. Um, it's just a Gaussian atom. And what you're modeling with a free parameter that you're fitting is effectively the radius of that Gaussian atom, which then adjusts the overall volume. What magnitude does the Gaussian atom have relative to, say, an oxygen or carbon? That's a good question. 
Um, it does depend on the algorithm that you choose and what actually it's fitting. But what they've done is they've kind of come up with uh, these sort of chemical groups. So like a methane will have a typical um, uh, uh, group radius and then a, you know, oxygen and nitrogen will have their, will have their uh, radii. And then um, it, it really depends on whatever atomic group it's replacing. Um, so uh, it's it's it varies throughout the throughout the particle, if that if that makes sense. Okay, um, so why don't we uh, then move on to uh, ab initio three D reconstructions now? Okay, so there are a lot of different programs that exist for ab initio reconstructions. Probably the most common that you'll see are uh, Danon and Danif, and maybe nowadays Dents. I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll see about that. Um, uh, but in terms of bead modeling, definitely Damon and Danif are, um, which are which are sort of two versions of the same thing, um, the most common from the AdSAS suite. So the way that these bead modeling algorithms work is that they fill a space, a grid, with um, beads, right? So in the case of Damon or Damif, they fill it on this sort of uh, hexagonal lattice. Uh, whereas in uh, another program, which is similar called GASPOR, it's actually sort of a chain linked connection of a bunch of beads that are all um, uh, about the uh, carbon alpha distance apart. So it's sort of like a, a chain of residues, if you will. Um, but they're all basically on some kind of uh, predetermined uh, 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 set of rules that determine where these uh, atoms are allowed to be. And what happens is, in the case of like Damon or Damif, you have two possible phases of the model of, of the beads. One phase is the solvent, which is what we have in these gray dots out here, and the other phase is the particle. And so all of the beads are identical, and they're just kind of either on or off, right? And so what the algorithm does is it just switches the beads on and off. It starts with a random configuration, and it says, let's start with turning this bead on and off, right, and see. If it's on, does it make the cal does it make the calculated scattering profile fit the data better or worse, right? And so it does that for a whole bunch of different beads, and it does it, you know, potentially millions of times, and then it comes up with a configuration that best matches the experimental data. But you can't quite calculate all of them, right? If you've got something like two thousand beads, which is pretty typical, then there would be two to the n calculations, right? And we just talked about how these calculations are pretty expensive. So two to the n, where two, uh, where n is two thousand, is like more time than the age of the universe. So you can't possibly calculate all of the different configurations. So they use different approaches, like Monte Carlo approaches or simulated annealing, to try and sample this um, more. It's kind of a pseudo random uh, sampling, but it's a little bit more intelligent than than that. So. Um, what, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that one of the reasons why these algorithms work is because they don't only take into account the fit to the data, okay? So the fit to the data can be represented by this chi-squared calculation up on the upper right, where we have um, the total sum over all the, the uh, uh, data points of the difference between the, the experimental data at that point and the calculated scattering profile at that point divided by the experimental error at that point, right? So this is our chi-squared calculation. Ideally, chi-squared should be around one for a good fit. Um, and as you get higher uh, chi-squared, that's a worse fit. So one of the things that they found was that if you only allow chi-squared to drive the formation of the configuration of these bead models, then they tend to look really loose. They, there'll, there'll be like beads that are disconnected and in, off in different spots and things like that. Um, and so it won't look like a particle, right? We know that these particles are finite, that they're connected objects. And so we can use that information to our advantage. And so they put that information in the term of these sort of physical constraints that they call penalties. And these penalties discourage the production of envelopes that are loose or not compact or disconnected. And so they have, um, uh, rather than just minimizing chi-squared, they're actually minimizing also a score that uh, incorporates these penalties into this calculation. So they have to weight these penalties in some way, um, uh, and they come up with clever ways of doing that. But this allows for both a good fit to the data to be sort of balanced with the expectations of what we think a particle looks like. Things like it should be tight and compact and things like that. 
All right. Because it starts with random configurations of beads, every time you run it, even if you run it with exactly the same scattering profile, exactly the same data, and exactly the same configurations, if you run it 15 times, you'll actually get 15 different answers because it started with a random model and it's not searching through all two to the 2,000 possible configurations, right? It's only searching through a small uh, fraction of those. <coughs> so in order to determine what the sort of, uh, not unique, but, but pseudo unique uh, result is, you have to actually look at a bunch of different reconstructions. It's never going to be able to come up with one unique reconstruction because there's just not enough information in a scattering profile to do that. You have one dimensional information and you're trying to reconstruct a three dimensional curve or a three dimensional particle. And there's just not enough information to get a unique reconstruction. But we can do a pretty good job of getting a low resolution picture of what the average particle would look like. And so we run this like 10 or 15 times and we get like 10 or 15 different bead models, but what you notice is they're all pretty similar to each other at low resolution. Their overall shape is relatively similar. So programs like Damaver are used to align these different configurations and uh, generate sort of an average, it's not really an average, it's more of a consensus model, where if there's beads in, you know, if there's 10 models and there's beads in this location in five, at least five out of the 10 models, then it'll say, well, there's very likely to be a bead there in the actual particle. Whereas if there's only a bead there in one or two models, then it's probably just an artifact caused by the initial random seed. Um, so this is the uh, sort of averaging procedure in um, uh, bead models. Why is it reasonable to assume that all beads behave the same? It seems to me that bead in the core of the model ought to be less influenced by the solvent. That's true. Um, and they do account for that. So in their calculations, um, they uh, account for how many uh, uh, other beads of the particle they're actually interacting with. I think in, for example, in Damon um, or Damif, uh, there is a maximum of 12 contacts. And so they take a fraction of how many contacts are to particle beads and how many contacts are to solvent beads. And that works into this calculation of their penalties of uh, looseness and, and disconnectivity. All right, so these are just some examples of um, uh, bead models, uh, ab initio bead models overlaid with their crystal structures that were that were solved. And you can see that in general, again, at low resolution, it does a pretty good job of giving us this overall uniform density shape. Um, we have 12 residues not resolved here, 50 residues not resolved here. So you can see that the SACs can actually give you a little bit additional information. All right, and in the last section here, I'm gonna go over um, uh, the final uh, 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 ab initio uh, method that I want to talk about, which is dense, which is what I've come up with. So um, uh, I may spend a little bit more time on this just because it's more I'm, I'm more of an expert in it. Um, but this is really a fundamentally different approach to generating a three-dimensional model than um, something like bead modeling. And that's because it's unique in the fact that it solves the inverse scattering problem, right? All the other methods that I mentioned, they solve the forward scattering problem, where they generate a model, calculate the scattering profile, and see whether or not it matches the data and adjust it to best match the data. In this case, we're actually taking the scattering profile and having it tell us what our three-dimensional density is. And that's one of the things that really makes it unique. Because of that, dense actually calculates density. So it's not a uniform bead model. It's not a uniform envelope. We're not just getting a shape from this. We're actually getting internal density, um, uh, which is really useful because particularly for particles that have multiple different density components, right? So, so things like proteins, they can be generally assumed to have a uniform density at low resolution. That's a reasonably a good approximation. But some particles, that's not a reasonably good approximation. Things like micelles, things that have proteins and lipids, sometimes protein RNA complexes, for example. Um, usually that's okay, but sometimes, sometimes those contrasts have um, enough of a difference that uh, it's useful to generate density rather than just a uniform envelope. So how does this work? How could we possibly use a scattering profile to generate a three-dimensional density map? So it's important to understand this in the context of um, uh, two domains. We have our real space domain, which contains the electron density function. 
right? Or in sands, for example, it would contain the uh, neutron scattering length uh, density. Um, if we perform a Fourier transform on that electron density, we get its three-dimensional structure factors, often called a molecular transform. In crystallography, it's called structure factors. Um, all effectively the same thing. It's this three-dimensional complex function um, in reciprocal space, okay? If we knew all of the structure factors, which means if we knew all of the amplitudes and phases of those structure factors throughout this three-dimensional space, we could calculate an inverse Fourier transform and get back our electron density function. That's ultimately what we're after. So that's our goal is figuring out what are the amplitudes and phases of these structure factors in reciprocal space. Now, the problem is, is that even if you could get the three-dimensional intensities, intensities are the square of the amplitudes for those of you that don't know that, but even if you could get the three-dimensional intensities, which we don't from a Sachs experiment, but theoretically you can from a single molecule diffraction experiment, even if we could do that, we still don't know the phases, right? We know the 3D amplitudes from our intensities, but we have to solve the phase problem, okay? The problem is that in Sachs, we don't get three-dimensional intensities, right? In Sachs, we have this spherical averaging caused by the tumbling of these molecules in, in uniformly distributed random orientations. So you end up with this sort of uh, isotropic image on your detector, right? And so because of that, we can do a radial average and we end up just as uh, a one-dimensional function of intensity as a function of Q, as a function of effectively the distance from the center of the detector. And so not only do we have to solve the phase problem like you would if you only collected, if you were able to collect three-dimensional uh, intensities, but we also don't know what the three-dimensional intensities are. We don't know what the three-dimensional amplitudes are. So we have to solve the whole structure factor problem, right? We have to determine both the 3D amplitudes and the 3D phases in reciprocal space. So uh, this is where I developed this iterative structure factor retrieval algorithm. So this is the slide you guys have. Um, however, I about 10 minutes before, I realized that I have a new picture um, that might actually explain this a little bit better. So I'm going to go through this one if that's okay. So what we do is we start with random density, okay? We just fill a space with random density. It's As far as a computer is concerned, it's like a three-dimensional image. It's a grid of points in 3D. And we start with random density. Imagine this wasn't a blob, but it was random, okay? From the random density, we calculate the forward Fourier transform, and that gives us the structure factors, which are the sort of diffuse, continuous um, molecular transform picture that I showed you a second ago. Again, it's in, in three dimensions. We can calculate from that the intensities, which are just the amplitude squared. Okay, And what we know is that our experimental data tell us that the spherical average of these 3D intensities, this sort of brackets with the omega, the spherical average of these intensities should be what our experimental data show us, right? So if we do this from our calculated initial random densities, then they're going to be way off, right? Because they're starting random and they, they look nothing like our, like our data. But what we can do is we can calculate the appropriate scale factor to scale those intensities and apply that to our structure factor. So we take the square root, since this is the intensities are F squared, we take the square root of this ratio and we scale all of the radial bins by the same number. Okay, so see how these are in these radial bins. We do the same thing in the structure factors and we scale the Fs, the structure factors, in these radial bins such that um, these scale factors would produce spherically averaged intensities that match our experimental 1D scattering profile. So this gives us a new set of structure factors that are now matching our experimental data, right? And so once we do that, we can then calculate an inverse Fourier transform, and that brings us to a new electron density map. And as we go through this process, we iterate through it over and over and over again, um, we get better and better and better density. Now, in the real space domain over on the left, we apply things like solvent flattening. And solvent flattening is, okay, well, we see there's this big glob of density here, and there's this noise out on the edges, right? So what we do is we sort of wrap this with, we, we sort of isolate which grid points are particle grid points, and then we flatten all of the density outside of it. We set it to zero, okay? And so that gives us some extra information because we know there shouldn't be noise. In reality, the solvent is a very flat, constant value. And so we go through this process iteratively a few thousand cycles, 
and we end up with a final electron density map that actually matches our experimental data, but also looks like a particle does, right? So this is this process um, as a little bit of an animation. On the top, we have our random electron density. On the bottom left, we have in uh, the black dots our experimental data, and the black curve shows us the fit to the data, which is um, what we actually use from things like um, uh, what you do in RAW, for example, the, the, the genome program that where you're fitting the scattering profile and getting your P of R function, that's what that black curve is. And that's what we actually use as our target function. And then in red, we have the, the red dots correspond to the scattering profile calculated from this initial random electron density map. And then on the bottom right, we have chi squared, which is currently like 10 to the eighth or something like that, because it's random, right? So as we go, you can see that it kind of immediately um, collapses to a particle looking object, right? And then over time, over um, after iterating and improving the density, we update the solvent map. The solvent mask here and we um you can kind of see how it's chipping away as it updates every once in a while um, and that allows us to generate an electron density map that over time um, will converge to a solution something that actually looks like the particle so in this case we can actually go ahead and superimpose the known atomic structure to see how well it compares and you can see at least at low resolution it does a reasonably good job of giving us the overall shape but the important thing to note is that it's also giving us internal density fluctuations. Now, there's a lot of errors in it, right? Because it started with a random number, and we only have a 1D scattering profile. So one of the ways we can get around this is through averaging. Just like with bead modeling, we can do averaging here with density, OK? So we run this, say, 20 or 100 times, something like that, and we align them, and we actually calculate an average. And this is one of the unique things about density is is because it's density, we can actually calculate an average. And this is something that you can't do with bead modeling. There's no such notion of an average in bead modeling um, because it's just one or zero, right? And so with, with um, density, you can actually calculate um, an average. We can also use this to sort of uh, estimate the resolution, the overall resolution of the reconstruction. And we can effectively um, look at how well do each of the individual reconstructions align and correlate, I should say, with the final average. And from that, you can look at um, something called a Fourier shell correlation, and that helps you to determine an overall resolution. For dense and just for Sachs reconstructions in general, we're typically looking at something like 20 to 30 angstrom resolution is what most ab initio programs will be able to generate. Um, here's just, again, some examples of, of dense. Um, we have symmetry uh, able to be done, uh, imposed in dense. So here's GROW-EL. Um, we have this DNA binding protein that they were able to actually see these small hinge motions. Um, some symmetry applied here. Here's another one. This is actually SANS data. It can work directly with SANS data. One of, the, one of the advantages is you don't actually need to worry about form factors and things like that. Um, uh, and so this this was actually a real nice one too. You can see these little these little holes in the in the in the uh, gaps between the domains. One of the nice things about using density is that a lot of the tools that have previously been developed for cryo EM, things like flexible fitting tools and rigid body modeling and stuff like that, can be used directly with the output, which are MRC um, formatted electron density maps. So you can run those programs like in Phoenix or Coot or or what have you, and um, it'll do the rigid body modeling or flexible fitting and come up with an atomic model that takes your fragments and puts them all, puts them all together. Um, I'll go through this real quick since we're kind of running out of time and I wanna leave at least a couple minutes for questions. Um, so you can also do uh, membrane proteins that are, or, or mice cells, for example, where we actually can potentially have negative contrast, right? So we have the electron density of our particle in this black curve here, but we all, we, as I mentioned, earlier, it's embedded in a solvent. Now, most proteins, it's always positive, right? The, the contrast of the protein is almost always positive everywhere inside the envelope of the protein. But for things like micelles, where the interior of the micelle is made up of a, of a lipid tail or detergent or something like that, the actual interior is often less density than even the solvent. And so as a contrast, you actually end up with negative contrast in the interior, and that cannot be modeled by most programs, but it can be modeled in dense. And so here we have a nano disk, um, something called membrane mode. This is how we make it easy for people to do this. Um, in dense, so you just you just uh, uh, 
uh, give the option to use membrane mode and it allows you to get negative contrast. Um, it doesn't have to be membranes, it's just anything with negative contrast. Um, but, uh, but that works uh, really well. Here's a my cell. Um, you can see what happens if you give that data to um, bead modeling programs. Um, it, it tries its best to come up with a sphere that has negative region, but it, but it can't because there is no negative bead, for example. Um, whereas in dense, it'll give you negative density. Um, as a practical uh, uh, note, you can you also have to choose a contour map. Um, I'm just going to leave this here. Do you guys have the slides um, since we're running a bit out of time? But um, you can contour it at multiple different levels. Um, and you can also deposit all these different ab initio models or any of your hybrid models and even your now your density maps directly into the SAS uh, biological database. Okay, with that, I am um, done. Let me let me look at some of these um, questions in the uh, yeah, there's a couple, there's a couple of questions. I wanted to save them until you're done with talking about the algorithm because some of them may have been partly answered. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Is dense a better option for multi domain elongated proteins when considering variability of electron density? So, yes and no. Um, there are cases that dense is able to actually see these sort of blurred out regions of the density. But if it's too much, it's dense is still currently trying to model the object as a single particle. And even blurred out density, that, that sort of low contrast, is not the same thing as multiple different discrete positions that are averaged together in terms of scattering, because there's these cross terms that we have to account for. Um, it does, in my experience, do a better job of um, these flexible regions. Um, um, not necessarily for elongated proteins, though we're working on, on improving that. But when it comes to these flexible regions, um, yes, I, I found that it does uh, generally a better job. It seems that there's a lot of places for binning with these methods as we have a finite Fourier transform radial averaging. Has this caused any issues? So potentially, if you were to do this at high enough resolution, yes, it could. Um, we haven't experienced any issues because um, we do this sort of oversampling. And the oversampling is taken into account when you do these like fits with, with genome or other indirect Fourier transforms. And it takes into account the oversampling. Um, and so that helps to, uh, to deal with this issue that would be caused by binning. If you have too low, too, too small of a box, it can, it can sometimes affect it. So one of the tricks is if you find a poor fit with dense, for example, if you increase what's called the oversampling, then that can, that can, uh, that can help by effectively making the bins smaller. Um, this procedure sounds similar to refinement for crystallography in the latter. Do you need an R free to prevent over or you need an R free to prevent overfitting? Do you have a similar metric with your uh, method? No. Um, and mostly the reason is because we just don't have enough information in a scattering profile to do that. Um, in crystallography, you could have, you know, 30,000 unique reflections. So losing 5% of them isn't that big of a deal. Here, you might have 10 pieces of information. So losing one of them is a pretty, pretty big deal. Um, and generally, it's usually just the lower resolution, like three or four, that actually decide what your particle shape is. So unfortunately, we, don't, we just don't have enough information to be able to spare um, for an R-free calculation. Since we get an approximate ensemble average from SACS, do your densities have better agreement with structures obtained from NMR than extra crystallography? Great question. I don't know. I've never actually uh, tested it. You could theoretically test it um, uh, by looking at something like uh, correlations, like cross correlation scores, cor correlation coefficients in real space, or a Fourier shell correlation. You could you could test that. That's a great question, though. I, I don't know the answer to it. I haven't, I haven't looked at it myself. Actually, have a question. Um, unless you, uh, so sometimes uh, people talk about like the the uniqueness of a reconstruction from from these methods, right? Um, how how are those generally calculated? Like how how do people how is it how is it determined what the estimated uniqueness of a shape reconstruction is? Uh, so that's a loaded question because of the terms you're using. Um, so uniqueness has a mathematical definition. I think what you're referring to is effectively resolution. Um, sure. yeah. So, so um, there is, so we, we're not actually calculating resolution. What we're calculating is precision, I guess you'd say, right? We're not calculating accuracy. We're calculating precision when we look at 
um, when we look at these resolution estimates. And uh, the, the with bead modeling, it's the same thing. Um, in fact, they effectively do the same exact thing here. Um, what you're looking for is how similar, when you run 20 of these, how similar are the 20 to each other? And it turns out that if you compare this with actual structures, when you happen to know the structures, that the um, resolution that you estimate from this sort of internal consistency metric that we're using here, this precision um, that we're using here, is actually really, really close to the actual resolution if you compared the average versus the known structure. I did this for like, um, actually my student did it for like, I think like 1900 different cases and there was this nice linear trend. So it's actually a really good, uh, a really good um, proxy for resolution uh, yeah. to do this. And this is actually what they do in Cryonium, right? In Cryonium, you have these two half maps and you're actually calculating precision and, and sort of internal consistency. Um, it's, you know, you don't know the resolution unless you have the true structure, right? So we're doing, we're doing, we're getting as close as we can, I guess. <laughs> And I might suggest that the question is uh, could also be interpreted to, to be asking about, say, something like ambimeter, where you try to estimate how many different structures could have created your scattering profile, and then that's that's actually what I was referring to. Like uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah. So, that so that's a, yeah, So that's a good question too. Um, so ambimeter is is a great way of sort of trying to simplify this problem. Um, but if you think about it, ambimeter only has, what, seven giant beads in it that it's actually using to describe a particle, and um, it's still all uniform density, right? So there's a lot of variation in there in terms of the, uh, that, that, that's allowed by having density um, that would not be accounted for in ambimeter. But I honestly don't know of a better way to do it than ambimeter because there's just too many different possible particle shapes that um, and particle density maps actually that um, you could generate right so I think ammeter is a great way to sort of assess this um, I found that dense does a really good job like for example this one that I showed um, right at the oh my life right here right at the uh, beginning this guy um, this actually has like the worst ammeter score in the PDB it's like 3.1 or something like that so there's like 140,000 different configurations of these beads and ambimeter that all generate the same thing. And Dense actually does a pretty good job of, of reconstructing that, that unique shape. And so I think that's one of the advantages of density. It's allowed to get these internal variations um, that help a lot. Oh, there's, a, there's another question. Maybe I missed it, but can you feed Dense an MD obtained trajectory of your protein use to estimate a density as a starting guess? Um, Theoretically, you could. There is a program called dense.refine.py that allows you to give it a starting density. It's not designed for that. It's designed for giving it an average to density and then refining it to a single to a single density that matches the scattering profile. I guess theoretically, you could sort of hijack it to do that, but I wouldn't recommend it because I've never tested it myself to know if it really would would work. With there, there's a lot of considerations in calculating a density map from a protein structure. All these things like solvent and contrast and stuff are very non-trivial. Um, theoretically, you could do it, but but it would be it would be a, it would be an involved task. Well, it does actually lead to a question I had, Tom, which is that um, these days, damn if uh, the newest iteration uh, estimates a starting volume as a type of shape, right? They look at the profile, they try to guess the shape, and they they use that as a seed volume to both improve the, the fitting and speed up convergence. And uh, is there any possibility of doing something like that in dense instead of starting completely randomly? You could theoretically, sure. Um, uh, there's, yeah, there's no, there's no reason you couldn't. Um, I think the, the main issue would be bias. Um, mm -hmm. Bias in density is more of a problem than it is with bead modeling because you lack that additional restraint of uniform density, right? There's just more parameters that you're fitting and therefore you're at risk of overfitting. So it would definitely have to be something that was sort of a, 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 a large, I would guess it would be a large undertaking to mitigate the bias associated with it would be, uh, but, but I don't think there's any fundamental barrier to doing that, no. Uh, 